ball can take you a lot of places. All over the world, if I'm being quite frank. Be formless, shapeless. Be water, my friend. Yo, yo, yiggity, yo, welcome back to the Beast Podcast. I am your host, Deshaun Beasley, and you can find me on Instagram at Coach underscore Bees. On today's show, man, got a really special episode for y'all. I really enjoy recording this episode today. It was with Coach Willette White, um, who's been in the game for 36 years. Her bio is remarkable. Like, I'm not even going to try to quote everything. So I, I just had to write it out so that way I can read it because I'm just that impressed with uh, the amount of years that she's been in the game of basketball and helping student athletes. So Willette boasts a remarkable four decade career as both a standout college athlete and a distinguished coach. As a two time all region and all American player at the University of Idaho, she earned the honor of induction into the Basketball Hall of Fames. Throughout her coaching tenure, White has remained steadfast in her commitment to empowering young female athletes and their families to navigate the intricate terrain of college selection with confidence and clarity. With over 35 years of invaluable experience in the realm of, in the realm of collegiate women's basketball, White has served as Director of Operations for Utah, University of Utah, for the past six years, following an initial stint as an assistant coach from 2011 to 2013. Notably, she has also lent her expertise to the esteemed USA basketball program, having served as an assistant on UConn coach Gino Yumanura, Yumanura's staff for the 2001 under 19s Junior World Championships. Additionally, Coach White has contributed her insights to the USA Basketball Women's Collegiate Committee from 2001 to 2004. Her profound impact extends throughout the Pac-12, 26 years she was in the Pac-12, where she has left her mark at esteemed institutions such as, such as the University of Washington, UCLA, Northeastern University, the University of Oregon, and the University of Utah. White understands that the journey to success for aspiring athletes transcends mere college acceptance. She recognizes the myriad emotional challenges that can arise, threatening to derail athletes off the court. Leveraging her wealth of experience, White emphasizes the importance of fostering enduring relationships and providing unwavering support throughout the transition from the comforts of home to the demanding rigors of collegiate athletics. Upon retiring from women's basketball in 2019, she found herself contemplating her next steps. Time and again, her thoughts gravitated towards the welfare of student athletes and how she could continue to support them in a new capacity. Memories of the challenges many student athletes faced upon arriving on campus flooded her mind. It was from these reflections that her idea for next step with passion and purpose emerged. So ladies and gentlemen, we'll let white enjoy the podcast. Talk to you soon. Peace. All right. If you could just go ahead and um, introduce yourself briefly and then give us three things that you're grateful for today. Yeah, so my name is Willette White, and I was in women's basketball for 36 years. Um, I was at some amazing places like the University of Washington, UCLA, and uh, Northeastern University, University of Oregon, University of Utah. Um, so I had a 36-year journey in women's basketball at the highest level, and I retired in 2019 and sort of had to kind of take a step back and figure out what was next for me. Mm. So I am. Mm. And what would you say, <clears throat> and this is just, this could be right now in general, but like, what would you say, like some things that you're just generally grateful for? I, I love to start the podcast off with just a, a moment of gratitude, just in general. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's a great 
great question to start off with. I think first and foremost, as um, every year passes for all of us, I think we become more grateful from the fact that we get to have another day on this earth and wake up in the morning and go about our day and do the things we love to do. I'm very thankful for my family and I'm thankful for the relationships that I've built in my 36 years um, in women's basketball. Those are mm. really, really important relationships to me. Nice. And and you mentioned that, you know, you played and, and coached that at the college level for been in women's basketball for a lot of years, you know, imagine um, I'm a middle school or high school basketball player, and I want to do exactly what you did. That is what I picture. Dominate in middle school, go to high school, go to college, and then just be around the game. Like, what are just some general advice that you would give somebody? I think before I gave any advice, I would ask a lot of questions. I would ask their why. I would ask mm. what they dream about. I would ask what they've done to get to this place. And I would ask what they've done to get some kind of uh, a skill development or exposure. But I think first and foremost, I would ask about their why. Because unless their why is in, in alignment with what they want to do, it's not gonna matter any advice that's given. If mm. their why is because their parents want them to play or someone else wants them to play, I wouldn't give any advice. I would just encourage them to follow their heart and their gut if it was what they wanted to do or didn't want to do. Mm. So that's yeah. where I would start first and foremost, Deshaun. Yeah, I want to dive deeper into that because uh, I'll yeah. share a little bit about my personal story. Like when uh, I didn't play high school, oh, I, I played middle school a little bit. I didn't play high school until my junior year. I played JV, senior year was a bench warmer. Um, and then after in college, that's when I actually started to work on my game. And I eventually was able to walk on to a school and play for three years. But and I just want to piggyback off of that, because like my why was in the wrong place. So when that ball stopped bouncing. Um, I wasn't able to cope with that. So what would you say, like. To that person who might be doing it for the wrong reason, because you might start off doing it for the wrong why, but then actually start to love it. I guess what would you recommend to somebody who's in it, you know, their death set on that goal, um, but they may not know how to maneuver maneuver after um, basketball, like uh, obviously due to the misalignment. But what is something that that some advice that you would give that that individual? Yeah, I would make sure a young woman or a young man knew who they were outside of their sport. I would dive into sort of what um, what they feel was is important to them and who they are outside of being a basketball player or an athlete or a swimmer or whatever. Um, so I think first and foremost, I would dive in not only to the why, but um, uh who they are their identity outside of being a student athlete mm. and then my advice would go from there if uh if I could make space for someone to develop who they were outside of an athlete that would be I, I would I would love to be in that process to help someone figure out who they were outside of uh, being a, a athlete or wanting to be a collegiate athlete because so many athletes on campus they identify as a basketball player or as a football player or as a baseball player and it's not until two months prior to their senior year that they start trying to figure out what's next and panic so I think I dive into the why and uh, their identity prior to um, giving the advice of the track of the hard work and the skill development and the academics and all of those things. I think yeah. first and foremost, I need to know them as an individual. Yeah, no, that's, that's well said. It's like the driving factor. You know, For that's sure. Your, that's your goalpost. Um, yeah. So I guess we'll kind of dive into more of the technical side of basketball. Uh, what would you say, cause you've played and coach at um, a bunch of levels and, and have had, uh, ladies go on to the professional ladies uh, professional levels as well 
what would you say some of the key differences are between high school and college um, and then making that transition from college to the pros? And is there a big difference between WNBA and the overseas game? What are your thoughts on the, the different levels um, of basketball? Yeah, that's a great question. I think first and foremost, as you uh, go from one level to the other, there's so many layers to it, right? There's there's better skills at the next level. There's there's strength. More individuals are are stronger and faster and quicker. Uh, the work ethic is completely different. The pace of the game is completely different at every level. So uh, the challenges, the demands, all of those things are very, very different as you go from high school to college, especially. And then college to the pros is the same thing. The strength, the pace, the skill level, the work ethic, the hours they put into the gym, uh, they're uh, taking care of their bodies and recovery and nutrition. And that becomes so much more critical at the professional level because you're getting paid to be the best that you can be. And yes, in college, you're getting a, a, a athletic scholarship to pay for your education, but there's still young women and men haven't figured out kind of the nutritional piece in college as well as they do once they get to the pros. I think that's a huge difference along with the things that I mentioned, the strength, the pace, the skill level, the work ethic. Um, and uh, I don't know about Europe and WNBA because I've never played in either of those two leagues. Um, Europe seems to be a little more finesse and sometimes you get to the WNBA and you'll have the, you know, the strength and the, the power of an individual inside. So I'm not totally sure on the uh, Europe and the WNBA comparison. Okay. Now I appreciate that transparency as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, next question is, I know you've helped a lot of players make that transition, obviously recruiting players and then, you know, past college. Um, what would you say, or I guess, can you share some insights into the college basketball pro uh, process? I know that's a very open-ended, but um, like when should, when should players start going to uh, not recruitment camps, but uh, I don't know why I'm blanking on it, but when the colleges hold the camps. Um, yeah. Um, for the but players to come in, like when should they elite start camps or something like that? Yeah. yeah, I think first and foremost, um, they need to create a plan. Okay, it's so critical to figure out what your priorities are. What is the most important thing? What level do you want to play at? What level does your skill give you an opportunity to play at? You know, right? Because you could have young men and young women who are probably better fit for the D2, D3 level, but it's D1 or bust. And that doesn't always work out. Um, I'm not totally sure what, why they get so enamored with the division one level because there's great programs out there at the D2 and the D3 level. So first and foremost, I'd, I'd have them create a, a plan around what their priorities are, what they're looking for, um, who they are as an individual. I always go back to that. Um, they want a big college, a small college, away from home, close to home, all of those things. So to create that plan, I think would answer some of these questions. Mm. Um, the timeline of when you should go to camps, are you talking about like AU or Blue Star camps or some of those identifying camps? Or are you talking about the camps on a college campus? Because yeah, those guess, two things are really different. Yeah, I think we, I mean, either route you go, let's actually go more of the, the exposure route. Um, okay. You know, with the, with the, uh, the AAU and, and the elite yeah. camps, and because that's become big, right? Everybody wants to play on the top circuits and get that exposure piece. So like, when should players be looking to do that? I think sooner the better. Um, if, if you're able to find a really solid AAU program, that travels to the places that college coaches are gonna be in the month of July when they can go out and recruit or that weekend in April. I think it's really, really important, but you have to ask the right questions to be on the best team possible for yourself. Cause you could be, there's so many AU teams, you know this, from 20 years ago to now, it is ridiculous. And 
many of the people who I think are running these AAU programs don't always go out and get the exposure. Maybe they stay locally or, you know, very not traveling along a, a far distance and not going to the best camps. And um, you got to do your research on what level you can play at, what AU program you can play at, and um, where they're going to go. If that really truly is a goal. And that's all in the plan that needs to be mapped out. Mm. So in that in that plan that you're creating for for a hypothetical athlete, when should they start applying to schools, visiting schools? Like I, I teach middle school, so um, and here in Providence, and there's a lot of schools that you have to apply to get into high school. And I have oh. a lot of athletes who are like, oh, like well, when should I start applying for colleges? Like, is it the same as high school? I just wait till a year before, you know, there's a lot of uh, ignorance around that area. So when should they start applying? Um, when should they start visiting campuses? Is it ever too early to visit a campus? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so let's talk about the applying piece. I think every school is different, right? There's early admission, there's late admission. There's, so every school is different. I don't think when you're applying to college, you're going to apply more than a year out more than you know a year out to know that you're going to be going somewhere in September and most people find out in January or February so I think um, uh, just knowing the places that you have an interest in uh, looking at when their applications are due basically all of that stuff is online so a young man or a young woman can find all that information online when you talk about visiting schools I don't think it's ever too early to step on a college campus to get a feel. Big college campus, smaller con or college campus, D2, D3, D every, every level, especially if you're playing on the AU circuit and you're in these different cities, it's not a bad idea to get your parents or whoever may be in charge to pop over to a college campus that's 10 minutes away and just walk on that campus and get a feel. Yeah. You, you'll you know when you're walking on that campus, if the campus is too big, if it's too small, if it's not diverse enough, if it's mm -hmm. in the city or in a rural area, you'll know all of those things. So I would say it's never too early when you're out and about to do that. Mm -hmm. But everyone is different and everything is different. Yeah, I kind of want to uh, build on that as far as... Yeah. A follow-up question that is, it would be, when should players start looking to receive offers? I know when I was in high school, very ignorant, a bench warmer as a senior, I'm like, oh, I got a letter in the mail. It's It, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a recruitment letter. It was not, we want your money, come attend our school because you're a great academic <laughs> student. So right. like as an athlete, obviously skill level depending, let's say, um, certain players, you know, they're, they're skilled enough. They're playing varsity as a freshman. And when should they start looking to receive offers? Should they even be look? I know it's a whole mind. There's a lot of things that go into it, but, but what are your thoughts on that whole offer, um, and interest, uh, transition that happens? Yeah. Um, it's a lot. everyone's different, right? Yeah. Um, every skill level is different when you have the top players in the country it's not unusual for them to get offers eighth and ninth grade because it's evident that they're going to be a great player other levels when it's a continual development like I said everything everyone is different but the exposure during those uh, evaluation periods um, are really really critical and exposure in, at those times, is, that's not the only way to get exposure, and we can dive into that later. Mm. But I think it's so hard to say that you should have an offer by your junior year. I don't want to say that because you could have a junior uh, offer in your senior year, and it turned out to be an amazing experience. So I don't think there's any kind of it's it's not cut and dry like that in terms of deadline. Yeah. So I wouldn't want to throw that out there and have people panic if they haven't gotten something by their senior year, because some of their, I, I imagine there's some beautiful 
stories out there of people who got recruited late and had an amazing college experience. Yeah. Yeah, I, de I definitely agree with you on that one for sure. Yeah. What are some, what would you say are some common misconceptions or myths that players have when it comes to playing college basketball? That they're going to be the big fish that they were in high school, that they have it all figured out. Hmm. I think one of the biggest things that families um, mistake that families make is once their daughter or son decides they're going to play at college X, they think the process is done. So they're washing their hands because mm. so many parents have invested so much money and time and emotional support and everything to get to that scholarship point, right? When they get a scholarship, it's not over. In reality, things are just beginning. Mm. How many stories have we heard of, of when a young man or young woman gets on their college campus that it's a nightmare, that if they're calling home the first six to eight months of being there wanting to come home because it's not what they thought. And um, so I think probably the biggest myth is I'm ready. Mm. When in reality, they're not ready. They've mm. washed their hands after they've received an offer, but they haven't done a plan. They haven't figured out how to get prepared and have readiness and preparation around stepping on campus. Mm. That's funny. I, I, I tell a lot of my students that the college process is like a job interview. You can't interview and get the job and be like, well, I got the job. <laughs> Let me just collect my check. Like, no, you got to go to work every single day. And hopefully the environment's healthy for you and you can learn and your skills and so on and so forth. But well said. I definitely agree with you on that. Um, well, and I think it's if you don't mind me just uh, putting this in, I think it's more than just developing the skill. I think it's getting ready emotionally because, you know, time management and being able to advocate for yourself and how are you going to handle not being the big fish anymore? And who are you um, outside of being a student athlete? And, you know, all of these things. The that, social um, clicks. Yeah, the social pressures and the peer pressure and the expectations and demands when you step on your college campus are tenfold. And are you ready for that? And that's what, why I undertook what I'm doing in, in my business is because I watched young women suffer year after year in their freshman year because they weren't prepared for what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Let's actually talk about that, that transition that you had. I mean, to go yeah. from, you know, coaching to helping people transition into basketball like what what sparked that like what is it that made you want to you know dive into this entrepreneurship journey that you're on I think as I said is I saw year after year and there's not a year in my 36 years that there wasn't a young woman who struggled that first year for many different reasons. You could add, like I said, time management or the social pressures, all of those things. And not everybody's story is the same. So, so when they get on their college campus, you, they don't know what they don't know, right? And they've been under their parents' roof for 18 years, 17 years, however the old they are. They have not had to make split second decisions. Um, they have had to um, uh, answer to their parents in terms of a curfew or where they're at. Parents have known where they're at 24-7. So now all the decisions, the decision-making is now their own. And so how are they going to handle that? And so I, there's no checks and balances anymore, right? Um, with the social and peer pressure that we talked about, social media pressure, all of those things, it changes things immensely so um yeah it became a passion of mine because I saw it year after year 
And when I retired in 2019 from women's basketball after 36 years, I really had to sit with what was next for me. Mm-hmm. And I came full circle on, I was like, okay, I'm done with student athletes. I'm tired. I don't, I'm done. And I came full circle and realized that there's still a, a huge passion of mine and their success is still a huge passion of mine. So I came full circle in what I do. Mm. Mm. Follow-up question to that is, how did you, <clears throat> not how did you, how can I phrase this question? What are some, I've, I've, I'm, I'm a big proponent of how you do one thing is how you do everything. So what were some of like the transferable skills from coaching that you're using now in, because entrepreneurship and coaching, I mean, two different realms in a sense, but there's some transferable skills. So like, what are some of those skills that, that you use in your coaching world that are helping you excel in entrepreneurship? Yeah, excuse me. Um, I think first and foremost, it's relationship building. I think that's always been one of my strengths is um, I'm really proud of the relationships that I built over 20, uh, 36 years. Some of my former players are still some of my best friends today. So I think it's uh, the relationship piece of reaching out to people and connecting and all of those things. I think it's also having to have a vision of what a young woman or a young man may need. Mm. having that vision and being able to create a plan. And I had to work with someone to really help me because it was such a new arena for me, entrepreneurship versus being on a staff with eight other people and, and, and going the same direction. Now I was alone. Right. So I didn't always Mm. know the steps, but I had mentors that were able to help me to develop this. So I think, um and and putting there's no ego involved in this what i want is for a young woman to have a easy transition her first year and i I shouldn't say easy a workable um transition and i want to be part of their village and their village is you know not only their parents and their high school coach and, and and some of these people that support them through the challenges that they're going to have it during that first year. Mm. Um, mm. Let's see, you kind of hit on. And I think I, yeah, and I think I have a deep understanding of the lay of the land of the college landscape. Right, um, for thirty six years, I've seen it. Um, many colleges are kind of turning their focus to the transfer portal. So I think that eliminates some spots for young women, but there's still a lot of opportunity out there. So I think it just a deep understanding of the landscape is, is so critical for, for what I do now. Yeah, you mentioned the, the transfer portal. And I know originally, like when I was in school, uh, like 10 years ago, has it been that long? My goodness, like 10 years ago when I was in college, it's like transfer, like if you transferred, it was like, oh my goodness, like, what happened what's wrong but like now right. it's like common practice obviously they change the laws where you don't have to sit or change the rules not laws change the rules where you don't have to sit out a year what are your thoughts on just general thoughts on like the transfer portal nil and how that will affect student athletes as they begin to make their transition into college like is it going to you know how could how would you recommend somebody maneuvering through that um, all those different um, things that are going on in the college world. Yeah, I think first and foremost, I, with the transfer portal, I'm neither here nor there. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. I think it's worked for some people and mm-hmm. I think it can be a nightmare for others. Normally, over 12,000 women's, uh, 1,200 women's basketball players were in the, are normally in the portal at the end of the year. Not every one of those come out and find a place to play. Some of them end up not continuing their career. Very few are going to go back because are they going to be wanted back? Mm -hmm. Many go to a lower division, which is fine. But to prevent that, I think it's 
Hmm. Don't worry you about that. You know that, that person? Yeah. No, that's my AI bot that takes notes for me, but because we oh, saw okay. it early, it's it's yeah. on early. Let me see if I can fix the uh the layout on that. I think I can hide them. But you can continue for sure. Yeah. So I think the transfer portal, I think it's a matter of finding your fit and doing all the research to be able to find the perfect fit that could eliminate the possibility of going into the portal. And I'm not saying that you take that away because if you get there, you've done all your homework and something happens and you just have to get out of there. I'm all for it. But I think doing the work prior to, as we talked about earlier, is having a game plan, knowing what's important, what isn't important. I think colleges can come at a young woman or a young man and say, oh my God, we need you, we want you. And that's all they hear. And they go to this place and they find out, wow, this is not a good fit. So I'm a big proponent of doing your work prior to even making a decision about the transfer portal. And the transfer portal is always going to be there. But if you find your perfect fit, and I, I do that too. I have an arm of my company that helps a young woman and a young man find their perfect fit. And I think it eliminates the high probability of going into the transfer portal mm. so and the, the nil you got to figure out i mean i think i don't necessarily want young women to focus on the nil piece because i i think there's money to be made but there could be money on a local level of what you do, you go to college and you have a really solid freshman year, you can come home and you can have a hell of a camp and you can, you know, work with these small businesses and you can do all of those things. Talk about it. And then when you get to college, there could be opportunities, but I don't necessarily really try to teach how you can brand yourself for NIL opportunities, because I think there's critical things that you have to prepare for. And I and NIL is icing on the cake for me. Mm, that's well said. So as we're getting into the closing closing moments, yeah. if you had to go back in time and you found your middle school self, what would you tell? What is one word of wisdom that you would give yourself when you were younger that you wish maybe you had or that you have wanted to hear? Like, what is that that word of wisdom that you would give your give your younger self? I think I would have told, I mean, I think back about my opportunities in middle school. They weren't what they are now. Mm. So if I could look back and tell myself then um, sort of what I know now, I would say find a mentor. Find somebody that can help you get better in your skill development and have you navigate this terrain. So I think I would try to, even at that early age, just find someone who could tell me, hey, do you want to play in college? If you do, because you're capable, you have the ability if you want to play in college, but here's what we have to do. Mm -hmm. I think I would have thrived off of that. Yeah. I would have loved to have someone to guide me. No doubt about it. Mm -hmm. That's such a big piece to the puzzle that people don't consider. Like, yeah, we, we hear a lot of things that we, uh, you know, on social media, get in the gym, get in the lab, all these things. And it's like, if, if you're practicing doing the wrong thing, is it really going to help? And maybe yeah. you're practicing something that you don't really need. Right. You know, and how do you know what you need if you've never been there? Exactly, exactly. And I think um, even at middle school, I was playing all sports and mm -hmm. I would encourage someone to continue to do that because my hand, I, I hand coordination because I was a tennis player was better for me as a basketball player. Mm -hmm. My foot coordination because I, you know, played softball or whatever was helpful in my next sport. So I would encourage someone to not specialize so soon, but I would also want a mentor to guide me mm. 
So if somebody wanted to reach out to you because they're looking for that mentor, because there are there are a lot of players who are looking for that mentor, how do they get in touch with you and what what should they expect um, when they connect with you? Well, first of all, they can expect someone in their village and they can expect that if recruiting is a difficult piece for them, the plan would be completely laid out. If they haven't thought about the transition piece, they need to, mm. and the plan will be completely laid out. And I will be in their village for eight months after their young uh, daughter or son gets on their college campus. I offer eight months of support. So what I do is I have an eight week program. Uh, we meet once a week and it's based on all the critical topics that I felt were important. We go through those topics in a, there's six topics. We go through, you know, the welcome, the six topics and we, the wrap up. Um, and we really dive into those topics and I really ask some really questions that they have to put a lot of thought to and, and dive into. Hmm. And then I offer that eight months of support and the recruiting piece is a year long journey with us. Hmm. So a young woman will find her perfect fit as long as she does the work, mm. as long as she does the work and not her parents or her high school coach. Mm. That's a whole so, other conversation I would love oh, to have right there because <laughs> I try to tell players like it's not your coach's job for you to go to college. Like it's it's actually your job. They, they're just support. However, yep. it's either here nor there. Yep. Yeah. But how do they get in contact with you? Where do they, where do they go? Yeah. So my company name is Next Step um, with Passion and Purpose. And it's Next Step Transitional Coaching.com. That mm -hmm. is my website. My email address is nextstepww at gmail.com. And they can always reach out to me via phone at uh, 541 632 3320. All right. Um, any last closing remarks? I know I I thoroughly I love talking hoops and especially like somebody with as much experience and knowledge as yourself. Like I would love to continue to pick your brain, but like the time that we've spent already has been amazing. I know my voice is gone. I've been coaching a lot the last couple of days, but but any last thoughts or comments? Yeah, I um my hat's off to you for investing in, in young people at the middle age level. I think that's so, so critical and so many skills can be developed at that level. And um, so I appreciate what you're doing. I think my last thoughts are just um, young women and young men knowing who they are and knowing their why. And, and as you grow up, you learn more and more about yourself. But I think just knowing the why is such a critical piece and uh, if the why is not there, like I want to do it for me, it's this intrinsic motivation. If it's not there, it's gonna be really a challenge to get in the gym and do your work and to, you know, academically and all those things. So I just really believe that the why is so important. Right, I agree with you. I didn't figure that out until, <laughs> I don't wanna say it was, too, it was too, until it was too late, but you know, it's never too late, is it? But yeah, I, yeah. I agree. I'm happy that you started there because that is more than overlooked these days. It's, it's the goalposts. If you don't know where you're going, you're just going to wasting a lot of effort and time and energy into yeah, working for something yeah. that you don't really want. Yeah, yeah. Especially if the pressure is coming from all these outside forces that they think that you, this is what you should be doing and this is what you should want to do and all of these things, you still don't have that drive, um, that inner drive to to get the work done. Yeah. Well, again, I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for following through with the with the you know with the communication as well <laughs> shout out to you for that for sure because this doesn't happen if you don't do that so I greatly appreciate that for sure yeah well I want to thank you for having me on and I look forward to you and I keeping in touch and just uh developing you know in kind of relationship that we can reach out to each other on occasion absolutely I would love that we'll yeah coach. It's been real. I hope you have a great rest of your evening and we'll talk soon. All right. Great. Thanks, Deshaun. Take care. Take care. Peace and blessings. You too.